Hello, everyone. We were just allowing a few seconds for more folks to join. We see that we've got people coming in now. Chris, can you let me know when the number of participants slows down? That'll tell us when we can begin. Okay. All right. Well, seems like now's a good time. So welcome again, everyone. This is our first lecture in the Distinguished Lecture Series this academic year. We are so excited to have our special guest with us today. We also have a number of people here in the room, as well as those joining remotely. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some logistics about how we can interact and communicate. If you are joining us remotely, please use the chat. Let us know if there's any technological issues or access issues that need to get resolved. If you'd like to make comments or chat amongst yourselves in the chat, feel free. We're also going to be using the Q&A feature for questions for the presenter. So please do use the Q&A for presenter questions. I would like to ask that everyone in person and online hold their questions though for the end of the talk to allow the presentation to run in its entirety and then we can select questions at the end. We'll do our best to moderate and manage questions between the in-person and webinar audiences. With that, I am going to pass the floor over to one of our current PhD students in educational neuroscience, who will more formally introduce our presenter today, Tyg Hicken. Tyg? Hi, everyone. I'm Tyg Hicken. I'm a first year PhD student in the educational neuroscience program. And welcome to our first PhD in Educational Neuroscience Distinguished Lecture hosted by Gallaudet University. This lecture series aims to honor world-renowned scientists in the fields of psychology, education, cognitive sciences, and neuroscience. These different fields and all the interdisciplinary fields in between contribute to the new and growing field of educational neuroscience. They increase our understanding of the human mind. This year's Distinguished Lecture Series theme is exploring the human mind from diverse perspectives. Today, I am honored to welcome Dr. Robert Engelbretson, an associate professor of linguistics at Rice University in Houston, Texas. Dr. Engelbretson received his PhD in linguistics from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and has gone on to publish extensively on various topics in linguistics as well as their intersections with Braille reading. In 2019, he was awarded the Darlene Bogart Braille Excellence Award. From the Braille Authority of North America in recognition of his work on IPA Braille which empowers access to phonetics for blind people working in the language sciences. That same year, Dr. Engelbretson, along with two of his colleagues, received an exploration research grant from the Institute for Education Sciences. And Dr. Engelbretson, has served as co-chair on the research committee for the Braille Authority of North America and 
has served as the U.S. representative to the Unified English Braille Committee at the International Council on English Braille. His work brings Braille research into the spotlight, offering a new perspective on literacy and our understanding of the neural, mechanism, neural mechanisms behind it. These are invaluable contributions because as we aim to advance our understanding of the brain and learning, it is imperative that we recognize and study this in the entirety of our diverse population. With that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Engelbretson. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. One uh, moment, a Zoom technical. A Zoom, something bad Zoom. happening with Zoom. Something bad happening with Zoom. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for that right. introduction. Well, thank you. Wonderful for that to be here. It's wonderful and, to be here. Uh, if you need me to and slow down at some point, just let me know. At some point, just let me know. I tend to talk. Uh, I'm going to basically try uh, and give to three talks and give in one today. Talks so here's today. our outline. Here's where we're so going. Here's our outline. Here's I want to start out by talking about Braille literacy versus uh, the cited versus, norm in uh, reading sciences. Norm in reading sciences. Uh, then I'm going to move uh, then to I'm going a to move brief to overview of English brief Braille. Brief overview of English and Braille. then we'll conclude by and talking about we'll conclude uh, by talking some of the findings uh, of our research team. Having to do, uh, you know, as a linguist, do, I'm interested you know, in, the, in the I'm interested in, the, in understanding in the, the interaction of in English sublexical structure English with the system of English with the system, of and then we'll English conclude Braille. hopefully we'll with the uh, questions with and uh, discussion. Questions and discussion. So this slide is a picture so of this slide our is a picture research of team. Our Research There's team. me, unless someone has there's me, unless substituted a picture of a iguana or something in my spot. Uh, and there's spot. my colleague uh, and Simon Fisherbaum, who is at the National Science Foundation, as well as the psychology as well department as at Rice University. And there's Dr. K. Holbrook and there's in the School of Special Education at the University of Columbia. And we all bring to and this work, our, own, this work uh, our own both unique uh, perspectives uh, and experiences unique perspectives with Braille, and experiences as well with as our as well as various our academic backgrounds, various academic uh, in the field. So we are an uh, interdisciplinary so are an research team. Uh, research team. Uh, we have been uh, and, doing this project uh, to, this understand project how, uh, to understand teachers, how uh, teachers uh, their, uh, teachers understanding uh, uh, teachers understanding strategies for and strategies teaching Braille. for teaching Braille. So whenever I present about so Braille, I, I like to start out by Braille, reminding like us all that literacy us is a basic literacy human right. Is a basic and this is just right. as much true, and this is just as blind and visually impaired people as it is for sighted people. As it is, for and Braille, people. Is and sighted Braille is and Braille is Braille is a tactile writing system. Braille is a tactile that enables system, people who are blind and visually impaired who are blind to read and write. Impaired. To read and Braille write. literacy is Braille linked literacy with is higher linked levels with of education, levels employment, of education, satisfaction. Employment, satisfaction. Basically, satisfaction. the difference basically between the difference uh, between learning Braille and not uh, learning Braille in some cases not learning Braille may, in some uh, cases make a difference may, uh, in employment a difference in and other very important aspects and other of life. very important aspects. Uh, Braille of life. provides a means. Uh, Braille provides a means of interactively of reading, interactively right, actively reading, reading right, actively and reading. Reading in our own voice, reading in our reading own at our voice, own speed, reading at our own independently speed, accessing independently literacy. Accessing Braille also literacy. provides the Braille ability to write, the and to importantly, write. to be able to importantly to be able read to what we've written, read like the notes written, that I'm reading like for this talk that I'm reading right now. For this talk. Braille enables right now. active engagement Braille enables with written language at all levels, language spelling, at all levels. Punctuation, spelling, punctuation, formatting. In other words, Braille offers, in other words, direct Braille offers experience with direct literacy equivalent with to literacy, that, which print to that affords for people who are sighted. Affords for people who are sighted. By contrast, you know, someone asked at lunch, well, what about technology and audio What about technology and audio making Braille obsolete? And my answer to that is always no. Those uh, literacy-related uh, tools, uh, literacy such as audiobooks tools, such and as synthetic audiobooks speech, and provide speech, uh, important provide tools in our toolbox. Tools, in but our those toolbox, are mainly passive but those access are mainly to information. Passive access to information. Uh, and technology uh, and hasn't made Braille obsolete hasn't made any Braille more than technology has made any more than technology for people who are sighted. And in fact, 
with and in fact, automatic Braille with translation automatic programs, Braille, translation Braille embossers, programs, and electronic Braille, Braille displays, and electronic Braille technology displays, has made Braille more available Braille and more accessible, more accessible than, accessible than accessible ever. It's actually a pretty good time to be blind. It's actually a pretty good time to be blind. We now have. Near instantaneous, now access, near instantaneous access uh, and virtually limitless access uh, and virtually limitless in Braille access to online Braille, resources, to online and electronic books. And electronic uh, so books. if I want to read a book in Braille, uh, so if I want to right read a book now, in could, Braille, instead right of giving now, this I talk, could, I could download instead a book from Kindle and start reading it in Braille right away. Um, so, you know, things are not perfect, um, so, you know, but are not this perfect, sure beats the way things were even 20 years ago even when if you wanted a book in Braille, it would have to be transcribed by someone and would take months and months before you months get and months your book. before you get now because of the importance of now, braille and the, the lives importance of, of braille those of us who read it of those organizations of blind people organizations around the world strongly advocate for braille, braille advocate literacy for braille the united nations recognizes united nations uh, recognizes, recognizes, uh, uh, recognizes uh, world braille day uh, annually uh, every braille january day, annually every and january and in the united states and in the united states a school age child's right to braille literacy is written in the federal law as the so-called braille provisions Braille of the individuals with disabilities the education with disabilities education Act. again reality often again, falls reality short often of falls short law, of but the law we're making progress but we're making progress So Braille has generally so flown Braille under the radar in the reading under sciences. the radar in the reading sciences. Not always. There's been some Not good always. work over the There's years. There's been some good work over but the years. But for print readers, but for print the science readers, of reading, the science has, of reading, uh, of understanding how reading uh, works, of understanding how, how it is learned, works, how and why some people struggle with it, why some people struggle with it, has provided a strong base for evidence strong base to support educational policies and educational policies and practices. Those learning Braille. Would Those benefit from similar support from the scientific similar support community. From the scientific community. But most general works but on reading most in the cognitive sciences are virtually silent sciences are virtually about silent. Braille. Just as an example, just I was really example, excited uh, was last really year excited, when the second uh, edition year, of when the second the science of reading of handbook, the science of reading came out. handbook. You know, it's this very large tome, you know, this very large kind of the compendium of knowledge in the reading sciences. And I checked with an ebook, you can search pretty easily. And there was not a single mention of Braille in this entire in this 700 and some page reference work on the state of the art in the science of reading. And that's really unfortunate. But the same is true of general works. The same is true of general works on reading. So the really excellent. Books really on the reading sciences for a general audience, audience such, as general audience, such as Mark Seidenberg's language, 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 language at the Speed of Sight. Language at the Speed of Sight. in the title. It's Language at the Speed of Sight. Or books um, by Marianne Wolf. Books by Marianne Wolf. Both of these authors do wonderful these authors work. And I wonderful wholeheartedly I recommend wholeheartedly their books recommend and their research. Uh, their books and their research. But the problem is but for the Braille readers, there is not any acknowledgement in these books. That in Braille books, readers also that Braille have readers reading also brains, have and that reading brains, uh, Braille literacy and that, uh, requires Braille literacy many of the same pathways, many and same of the processes, same pathways and that same print literacy. That print literacy. Now, of course, has. the overwhelmingly, now, of course, majority, the overwhelmingly, sorry, the overwhelming majority, majority of people, sorry, the who, read and write majority are people who read and, and write are cited, and print is the dominant means. And print is the dominant means. means. I understand that. I understand right? that. But the problem right? is, but the problem when the reading is, sciences focus when the exclusively on the cited norm, on the you, get norm you get what I erasure call erasure. You get what I erasure of Braille. Erasure and those of us who Braille. Read it. And those we of simply us don't read exist. It. We simply at don't all exist in these works at all in these works. Uh, and I'm quite sure this exclusion uh, and is, I'm quite not sure this exclusion intentional. is not intentional. But the consequences, but of the consequences not of including not Braille are that Braille remains unseen. Braille remains and those of us who read it remain invisible. Remain both invisible. in the reading sciences, both in the and in the general public, and in the general public. Right. So I would argue that right. the reading so sciences would argue need to stop treating Braille as some sort of niche Braille as some sort of issue of no interest. Uh, issue of uh, and interest. Since the goal uh, of the reading sciences is the goal of the reading sciences broadly understand how humans broadly read, understand how we need to recognize read, that those of us who read Braille are also human, and we are reading, and we are and reading. It is and in fact. There are very interesting in fact, things that have been found in the reading sciences about, about uh, Braille, and, and it really illustrates the uh, remarkable really neuroplasticity of the human brain, of the how human we adapt, brain, and what adapt, reading must be understood what reading to be, must be understood and the diversity of the world's the writing systems. Of the world's writing systems. Um, um, yeah.
I just talked about erasure. I just talked about the second erasure. way that Braille, the second way that uh, remains Braille, invisible in the uh, reading sciences is what I reading sciences would roughly is call, what I would um, roughly call um, uh, adequation. Uh, adequation. Basically, equating basically equating Braille and print, Braille and print, and we could sort of and understand this. Sort of they don't talk about Braille. They don't talk so about Braille. So we can just so assume we that can the findings of print readers must be relevant to Braille readers as well. Readers and as well. that can lead to and that can lead really wrong-headed assumptions, really about, Braille wrong -headed assumptions about Braille and its users. Uh, and its uh, the, users. Use uh, uh, the use of print-based print assessments, print assessments, print assessments, print assessments, print assessments and materials, or experimental methods, or experimental methods that are not appropriate for tactile readers. Not appropriate for tactile readers. So we have erasure, which basically says they don't talk about Braille, so it must not be important. So it must not be important. Adequation, which says they don't talk about Braille, so it must be the same as Braille. So it must be the same. And then we also have then, a lot of misconceptions about Braille, about Braille that misconceptions and stereotypes about Braille, that Braille is difficult, that Braille is slow, that Braille is slow, inefficient, Braille is inefficient. Uh, which, none of which are true, uh, which or none of which are true Braille readers. Or proficient and, Braille there's readers. Also a lot of and there's also a lot of stigmatization right, that Braille stigmatizes right, that Braille you, or if you are a parent of a blind or child, or if, child, if your child reads Braille, it will stigmatize them. It will stigmatize them. Heaven forbid, wouldn't want to Think, think of your child as blind. Think of your child as blind. So there's this idea in some so circles this idea of in some what we call print of at any cost. Print at any cost. In other words, the site-centric belief the site that reading belief, extremely large print, print extremely one letter at a time, time one is preferable time, to quickly is preferable and fluently to quickly reading with your fingers. And fluently reading with your fingers. And all of these lead and to all blind and visually impaired students being marginalized. Students being and again, marginalized. the lack of and again, the attention lack of to Braille attention in the reading sciences. Braille in the reading sciences. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, a lot of the There's research of, that has been uh, done a lot of on Braille that has, has done been mostly Braille, done by sighted people. And there's certainly nothing people. wrong with there's certainly nothing wrong people working on Braille. You know, welcome. <laughs> on Braille. We appreciate you know, it. Welcome. Um, <laughs> we appreciate but it. There um, also but has been a there lot also of has been a lot of assumptions, site-centric assumptions, assumptions site -centric baked into much of the work. Baked into much of the work. Um, for example, um, the for way example, that many of the way the, that uh, many of the previous studies uh, of Braille reading have been done of Braille reading have been uh, done. Uh, there are three specific ways that there are three specific I would claim ways have been I would fairly site-centric. First, first of all, work that contrasts Braille, Braille reading and print Braille reading. And I put little thought balloons on the slide and say balloons on the slide you think of. What it makes you think, right? Uh, contrasting Braille right. reading and uh, print contrasting reading. Contrasting Braille reading and print reading kind of starts from the assumption, kind of starts from the assumption that Braille is that Braille to print. Is that's inferior. usually kind of what is assumed. That's usually kind of what is work. assumed. In much Secondly, work. work that treats Secondly, Braille work that as a derivative Braille code, as a derivative based on code. print. Based on this print. positions the process of this reading Braille as decoding Braille as to print, decoding rather than as literacy, rather than its literacy in its own. Thirdly. Thirdly, work that compares individuals who are blind, individuals, and individuals who are sighted, and individuals in general, who are sighted, uh, to, in general, to better understand uh, to, to better so-called visual deficit, so-called visual against deficit the backdrop of sighted the backdrop normality. Of sighted normality. So these are three so these uh, are site-centric uh, approaches, site -centric, uh, approaches to Braille uh, that we often Braille, find in the literature. That we often find in the literature. Now, how do we start to move now, away from those? Start to move away from those. How do we decenter how the sighted perspective? The sighted Braille research, and that's one of my goals, research. and really the one of my goal of our really whole research team goal of our is to start to decenter the sighted perspective in Braille research. And there are several ways, of, and there are several to ways of working to bring this about. Working to bring this about, I think. First, adopt an First, equity, and adopt diversity, an equity based and diversity based. So understand and so affirm understand that blindness affirm is that blindness not is a deficit, not or a, a deficit. tragedy. But simply tragedy, one of the many diverse ways in which humans experience in which humans interact experience with the world. In interact with the world. And similarly, Braille and similarly is simply Braille one of the world's many is writing systems. One of the world's many writing uh, for representing language. Uh, for and representing needs to be language. studied in its own right. Needs to be studied in its own, in its own right on its own terms. Secondly, there's a need for Secondly, research teams to include research researchers teams to include who are blind and visually impaired, who are blind and visually impaired, and have the lived experience and have the lived experience of being Braille readers. Of being Braille it's readers. kind of shocking. It's kind of well, shocking. It shouldn't be. 
it well, shouldn't, it shouldn't strike be, me as shocking, but it, it still me surprises shocking, me to find still so much public find published so much public research published that doesn't research that includes doesn't the perspective include of the blind and visually impaired braille readers. Blind and visually impaired you know, braille it's, readers. Uh, the the idea you know, of nothing uh, about the, us the without us nothing about hasn't us without quite us sunk in for many of the psychologists who are not braille literate themselves, but are doing experiments and studying experiments and studies on braille. Anyway, so more representation in the so field more representation blind and visually impaired by braille readers. Blind and impaired Thirdly, braille readers. Thirdly, we need to design studies that take into account studies that take into diversity of braille reading, reading population. The braille reading. The population of proficient braille users. Population of proficient very braille users heterogeneous. Very heterogeneous. So there are differences. So in, there are differences uh, how, in uh, uh, how. Uh, in terms of the nature and duration, of the nature and onset and duration of our and visual impairment, of our visual there are differences impairment. among us. There are differences in among how we read Braille, whether you use one hand or both hands, or how many fingers you use to read Braille, how you use your Braille, fingers, how you use your fingers. And there are vast differences. And there are vast in terms of what our Braille education is like. What our Braille education so, for example, some of us were fortunate. Some of us have had regular daily Braille instruction early on in school, whereas others may have. Whereas have, others uh, lived in a district that have, only provided uh, braille instruction only for an hour or so per week, which is certainly not enough time to learn a writing system and to learn a writing system and to learn. Many may have learned braille after Many already braille having been after print readers, readers, which opens up a whole other set of questions and, uh, important and uh, research important questions. And some people are what we call dual media learners, so people who use both braille and print. At different, different times or for different purposes. At different times or for uh, different a friend purposes. of mine used to joke. Uh, he was a dual media, media joke. He was a reader. dual media. He joked that he, he reads print he with his nose. Reads print right, with his, his nose. His face is so close to the page. Right, but, so he but he reads braille with his fingers. But he reads braille with his fingers. Uh, and there's a need for researchers uh, to understand researchers these contextual to understand variables, these contextual variables, and their consequences. Variables and you their can't consequences. just sort of do the just sort of typical the, uh, cognitive typical, science approach. Uh, cognitive science take two approach populations, of, take two populations, uh, hypothesize uh, that. Uh, a difference is say due to uh, visual, reading due to visual reading versus and tactile reading, then and then run the experiment. And then because there are the so very are many so other variables that, that, play, into that, that uh, play into this. It is not. Play into this. These are not statistically uh, things. These are that not can statistically just be things that can just be away. controlled away. Um, so there were a couple of handouts. Um, so there were a couple of handouts went around. that um, hopefully went around. people got them. Um, so I handed out a Braille alphabet so card. You can take as many of those as you want. You can take as many of those as you want. And there's probably 20 people uh, here. And just so that you can have uh, and just uh, something so that you to can show what the Braille alphabet looks like. Show what the Braille alphabet and I've also uh, have also, a couple pages of actual Braille pages of that I'm passing around. Many of you may have never seen or felt Braille. I have cut the top right hand corner of the page of that because otherwise you probably that, wouldn't know which way is up. Probably wouldn't know which way is up. Uh, but feel free to uh, to uh, take as many of the alphabet uh, cards as you want, and, uh, just, pass and the, uh, just pass uh, around the, the, the sheet so that you sheet, can sort of so feel what Braille is like. Feel uh, uh, let's like. give y'all a break uh, from listening a break to from me. Listening to uh, me. And I want to show you a couple of videos. I want to show you a couple of how Braille is read. Of how so the sighted people in the room can watch a couple of videos of Braille being read. Videos of Braille being read. I don't think. Oh yeah, my sound isn't. Oh yeah, my. If it were the hearing people in the room could also hear Braille being read. So the swishing of the fingers across of the fingers across. There's a large amount of individual difference in terms of of how Braille is read, how many fingers, which fingers, whether you use one or both hands, whether you use one. And if you use both hands, what are the Hands both hands. Doing. What are the? And we also see doing? variation. And we in also terms see variation like the angle in terms of things like of the, the angle of the finger. Now Braille is always read from now, left Braille to right. Braille is always read from no matter what right, the print no writing system does. The print writing the system language. does in the language. Uh, the two videos you're about to uh, see are from a study that our team did a few years ago with fifty self-identified proficient self-identified Braille, Braille readers. Adult and you'll, Braille see readers. you'll see wires on the readers' this fingers. This is because we were using this is because an infrared, we using camera, using an infrared camera to infrared track camera fingers. Camera we don't track normally fingers. read. We don't with wires read fingers with wires. Course, but you'll see that in the video. Of course, but you'll see that in the video. So I'm going to tell so you what you will see in the first video. Then I will show the video. Then I will show the video. So this first video, so this first video, uh, you will see a person reading uh, using will see a person multiple reading fingers using on both hands. Multiple this is sort of the cold standard. This is sort of the cold standard. And moving the hands in what we call the scissors pattern. what we call the scissors Braille is always read left to right. Braille is always read left so to right. So when a hand is moving to the right, it is reading. 
And when a hand is moving to the left, when a hand is moving, it is tracking to the next line. It is tracking. However, even when a hand is tracking, even when a hand is tracking, it's still likely picking up. It's still likely cues under the fingertips. Tactile cues similar to what happens similar with paraphobial information. Paraphobial information. But uh, this has not but, um, uh, this has not um, been well studied yet. Uh, so it's a very well studied open yet question. So, very so what you'll question. see here, so what in you'll this video see here, is the left hand begins reading the line, begins reading, and then somewhere in the middle of the line, somewhere in the right hand meets it, the right hand meets it, and the right hand then finishes the right reading then to the end of that reading, line, while the, the at the same time, while the at the left hand is moving down to the next line, down to begin line. Uh, to begin at or shortly uh, before or shortly the right hand finishes reading. You, right you can, in fact, in Braille read two things at two the same time with different hands. At the same time with different very hands. Very long, maybe a word or two. Very long, but you'll see that. And I dare any sighted person to try and do that with your eyes. Do that physically impossible. Physically impossible. So here is the video. Here is the video. So <clears throat> what you saw here, the so, left hand know, what you saw begins here, the reading the next line, begins reading and the right the hand line, tracks back, and the right and hand in the middle, back, and, and so on. The, middle, the pattern continues and so on, down the page. The pattern continues this is the fastest and most efficient, most efficient way of reading Braille. Since so there's, there's always one hand reading and the other hand tracking. And the so other it's called the tracking. scissors pattern. So it's again, called the scissors because pattern. Because each hand reads part of the line. Each hand reads part of the line. One hand is reading, the other hand is the other hand is tracking. Stack of notes here is completely Stack falling apart. Here is so, completely I falling apart. So, I apologize. So, I apologize. So, I apologize. It's going to be messy. Um, it's going to be messy. So the person that you just saw is reading so at 244 reading words at a minute. 244 words a minute. So when people tell you Braille is slow, so when people tell you Braille is slow, uh, look at this guy. Uh, 244 this guy. words a minute is not a slow reading. Words a minute is not a slow reading speed. I want to contrast that I video contrast with the second one I'll show you. With the second one I'll show you. And in this video, and in this uh, video, a reader is uh, a reader is using is, only one finger. Is using the only index one finger on the, the right index hand. finger on the right. Hand. Um, now, since they're only using um, one now, finger, they're only using one. They have finger, to track back to the beginning of the line in order to move down to the next. In order to end down to if we had audio and here, the, if we the had hearing audio people here, in the, the hearing would people hear this. Would hear the scraping noise of the finger tracking back and forth along the line. It actually makes my finger. It actually makes my when I hear that. Itch. Talk about cross modal. That. Talk about cross modal. So, um, so you will see this person. Uh, you will see this person what called the one uh, finger doing, unguided. Called the one finger method unguided of method of reading. Great. So this person was Great. reading at 115 so reading words at per minute, so less than half per minute, fast so less than as the previous as person. As the previous person. Uh, there are faster one finger readers in our study, and there are two handed readers that are slower. But this pattern but is slower pattern and less efficient slower because, because of the time it takes because of the to do a return sweep. To do a return with the scissors pattern, reading is always happening. Trading off between the hands. Trading off between the hands. But with only one finger. But with there's only a one significant finger, amount of time spent a significant returning amount of time to the next line instead of reading the next line instead now of in general even though this is a less general, efficient even though this is a less method efficient and slower it seems and slower, that there are people who find, people who find this the most comfortable find this the most way of reading for whatever reason this is, this is a wide open area this is a wide open area in and terms attention of neuroscience and, and attention focus of attention and, and how the hand off and how the works hand two handed works readers two handed readers Uh, and there's a large, uh, uh, and oh there's goodness. a large, um, uh, oh goodness, um, which way am I, which way am I? I apologize. 
I this apologize. Mess on the podium. For this mess on the podium. And nobody's really ever and thoroughly really studied ever these questions. Of studied these questions. Why of, is there the preference? Why is there some the readers only read for some finger. readers only read and one what finger. happens and in what terms of happens uh, in terms neurology of, and attention? Uh, neurology with two-handed and readers when with when you have trade off when, when you have trade off between the hands. My point in showing you these videos My point was in to let you these see videos was to uh, let you two see of the common ways uh, two of, reading of the common ways what braille, braille reading looks like. braille. What so braille let's move on now and talk about what braille is as a writing system and some of the findings and some of the findings ongoing work. Of our ongoing work. So earlier I said that Braille is a writing so system. I said that Braille so is a writing to system. To define so that, to um, define that, a linguist define um, a writing system. Linguist define as a writing an arbitrary system, set of as symbols. As an arbitrary set that of represents symbols, a spoken language. That represents a spoken language in a non-ephemeral, in a non-ephemeral way. Non in other words, way. language. In other words, that language is on paper or on clay on tablets paper, or, or on clay tablets or on computer disk on some sort of medium on some that sort doesn't of medium that doesn't go away. In the same way that spoken language, same way sign language, spoken language, or sign language goes once it's been spoken goes, or signed. Once it's been spoken, or um, signed. an um, arbitrary set of symbols. An arbitrary set of symbols. Those symbols we call the those script. Symbols, we call the script. So what are the symbols of the writing so what system? What are the symbols such as the, the Latin system, alphabet, the Cyrillic the alphabet, 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 the Cyrillic Chinese alphabet, characters, the Cherokee uh, syllabary, and so on. Cherokee syllabary. And the and second so part of and the, the writing system. Part of the writing system uh, is what we call the orthography. Uh, what we call the orthography. How the symbols of the script how the symbols are arranged, of the more sort of colloquial, arranged, more colloquially, colloquially we can call colloquially we uh, can that call spelling. Uh, that spelling. English Braille, like English, English print, Braille, like is a English print, written representation, is a written grounded representation in, in this case, grounded spoken in, English. in this case, spoken English. And yeah, I, I understand that. Yeah, that is, I understand uh, far more nuanced is, uh, than that, nuanced especially for people that, who, especially for uh, people who haven't had access to uh, haven't had spoken access language, to spoken language uh, before learning to read. Um, so I, uh, of course, uh, so I acknowledge uh, of course, that this definition uh, acknowledge is that this definition uh, oversimplified. Is, uh, oversimplified. Um, the, um, the Braille script is a Braille tactile script, script based tactile on script based on a character. Called a, a braille cell. Called a braille cell. There's one on the screen here, which there's one on the uh, screen. Don't reach here, out and touch your screen. You won't reach out and touch your screen. You won't be able to feel it. You'll just leave a finger. Um, this is a um, braille this cell. Is a and braille cell. we refer to the and we refer upper left the dot in the cell upper left as dot, dot one in the cell as dot one. The middle left dot as dot two. The middle left dot as dot and the lower left dot as dot and the lower left. And then down the right hand column and down the right hand column dot and six five. And six. Since there are six dots, since there can either be dots, raised or can not, either be raised. This is essentially a six. This is essentially a six system, right? System. Two to the power of six. Right? So you get sixty-four six, you get possible 64 combinations. Possible. In other words, sixty-three other characters, words, sixty-three and a blank characters. space and a blank space. This slide shows the English this Braille alphabet, the, English the letters A through Z, a few of the punctuation symbols, and a few of the modal indicators. Uh, for example, dot six. Uh, for example, shifts six, the meaning of the next character. The meaning to be, of the next character uh, to a capital be, uh, letter. A capital letter. Uh, the symbol dots three, uh, four, five, six. Dots three, shifts four, five, the meaning six, of the next character the meaning from the letters the A through J from the letters to the, a to the J, digits one through to the digits. I don't want to spend much time on this slide, slide other than to show you what the English Braille alphabet looks like. You'll notice that the letters A through J are all made in the upper two thirds of the cell. Two thirds of the, cell. the letters K through T, the letters K through T are exactly the letters A through J, except with the addition of dot three. And then that pattern continues with U through Z, with the addition of dot three through six, with the addition of dot with the exception of W, with the exception of W, when Louis Braille invented the Braille system in the early 1800s, W was not a character in the French alphabet, and so it was added in later. Added in later. Uh, the Braille card that was passed, uh, the that Braille was card passed that out was passed here has, passed uh, the, English here alphabet, has uh, English the English Braille alphabet, alphabet on English it. Braille alphabet on it. So let's move on uh, so talking, move about on, uh, talking about English orthography. Braille orthography. English Braille has two orthographies. Braille has two or we call uncontracted Braille, we call uncontracted and contracted Braille, Braille and contracted Braille. So, uh, so one uh, of 
The thing about well, English Braille orthography, the thing about English is, that orthography is that it is not simply a transliteration of English print into the Braille script. Into the Braille you script. can do this. You just can take do the this. English Braille just take the script English letters Braille and script substitute letters them for the English print. Substitute script for the English letters. print script. Um, right, using the letters of the Braille um, alphabet right, one for one for the Braille alphabet one print one for the corresponding. And that's what we call uncontracted. That's what we call uncontracted. But to be a fully literate reader of English Braille, in other words, to read most of the materials that appear in Braille from blindness organizations or Braille publishing houses or ADA signage, ADA signage. We use an orthography called contracted. Called contracted and this consists of 180 and this consists of 180 contractions. contractions. Contraction is a form Contraction that represents a, a group of letters represents a group or a whole letters. word. Or a whole and I'm word. talking for those of you who know I'm Braille. Talking for those I'm talking about Braille. unified English talking Braille. About unified today, English of course, Braille. because that's been the today, system of, of Braille. Uh, been the system uh, used in the United States uh, since used in the United States since 2012. Uh, and uh, um, and I've put um, on the slide here some I've examples put on the slide of here contraction. Some examples of so contraction. dots two, three, four, so six. Two, three, four, six corresponds to the sequence T H E. So you use this wherever so the sequence T H E would appear. So wherever the sequence T H E would appear. Uh, so, would appear so for example, the so word the. For example, the so word the. Uh, the word own, theory. The word or theory. Or the word brother. Or all the word has brother. the. T H E contraction in it. T H E. There's a symbol for I N G. There's a symbol for There's a symbol for there's, ED, a there's, a for there's a symbol for E N, and so on. E These are just representative so of representative uh, Braille contractions. Of, uh, Braille contractions. Now the E D symbol. That's now the one, ED two, four, symbol. Six. That's one, uh, two, this four, is going to come up later. So uh, this is going to come up it. later. So I want to focus um, on it. Um, these I should point out that these are single graphemes. These are single. They're not decomposable. They're not decomposable into say an E into and say an E. There's nothing and in. Symbol. There's nothing in the symbol dots one two four six that means one, either E that means or either E. The single is a the symbol is a single orthographic single unit orthographic unit. When we write Braille contractions, uh, when we write print, Braille contractions uh, our team, in print, we gloss our them. Team, we with gloss them small caps with in print small so that you can see that it's a contraction. So, so that it's when, a you contraction. Here, so dots, when you two, see here dots, when you see here dots, gloss two, three, four, six, with as uppercase, th with that means that it is a single that composite means that symbol, a single in composite symbol in Braille. There are also multi-cell contractions. There are also multi-cell contractions such as followed by the letter E, for the letter sequence E V E R, in words such as ever or forever or beverage or even beverage or even Fever. Dots four five six M. Dots four five six M is a contraction for many. Is a contraction for like many. The word many, or like even the word many. Surprisingly even, enough, in the country named Germany. Enough in the country named Germany. That's a false that's morphological a false analysis. Morphological but Braille analysis, but there's no many does it. in Germany. But there is no in Braille in Germany. But there is. So there are 180 of so these there are contractions that Braille users need to know users need in order to, to know be a fully literate in reader, order to be a fully literate reader or writer of English Braille. The standard setting bodies that standard setting bodies that English Braille govern provide a list of prescriptive rules for correct Braille use and a list of words that are exceptions to that are exceptions. So official correct use of Braille contractions. Correct use Prescriptively uh, defined by the uh, Braille Authority of North America and the International Council on English Braille. Now, most of our current now, teams most work of our focuses on teams work Braille orthography on Braille and its Braille relationship to sublex relationship to sublex. I'm a linguist. I'm uh, uh, interested in I'm, language structure uh, after all. Language structure and after this all. Is a very and this is a very question. linguistic relevant. Question. So, um, so I need um, to take a slight detour. I need to take a slight detour. Oh, whoops. Uh, I ooh, whoops. need to not uh, take that detour. I need to back up a slide. I need to back up a slide. Uh, and define what sublexical structure uh, define is, what sub for those structure of you who is for those never of you took who a linguistics course. Never took a linguistics course. So sublexical structure so refers sub to unit structure that are smaller that are smaller sub than a sub whole word lexical, than a whole word lexical but larger than an individual letter larger than an individual or letter. Or and these fall under uh, and the categories fall of under, digraphs, uh, the categories so a group of, of letters digraphs, that represents so a, a single letter that represents a single. For example, phoneme. the sequence of letters. For example, e the sequence of letters e e represents the sound. Represents e. the sound. E. Uh, I'm not going to focus much. Uh, I'm not going uh, to focus at all. Uh, on, uh, I'm not going to focus uh, at all. Digraphs. Today. Today. Syllables. Whoops. Syllables. Whoops. Sorry. 
syllables are uh, i know syllables are is, uh, i know this is uh, there are all sorts of different definitions of syllables of different don't, definitions uh, of syllables don't shoot me don't, here uh, don't shoot me define here. syllable as a group of define letters syllable as comprising a group of letters an uninterrupted comprising perceptual an uninterrupted unit perceptual like unit. the chunks of the word like un, the chunks of the word no un, uh, bull no uh, bull and morphemes the uh, morphemes, units that I'm going to uh, care about units for the that rest I'm going to care about for the morphemes rest are the smallest morphemes units morphemes that are the pair smallest form units that with pair meaning. form with so in meaning. english these so are english, stems these are prefixes and suffixes, and suffixes. prefixes so for instance so for unknowable as the negative prefix as un, the negative prefix stem un, no the stem and the no, ablative suffix and the ablative abul. suffix abul. Strengthened is historically strengthened co complicated, is historically but essentially complicated, has the stem strength, has the stem strength, the suffix n, the suffix which makes into in, a verb, which makes and then the past verb, tense suffix, and then id. the past tense suffix id. dogs, has the dogs, stem dog plus the plural the suffix, dog plus z. the plural suffix, re draw, re draw, consists of the prefix re, which means the prefix re, in this case which means do again, in this case plus the do stem again, draw, plus the stem. So there's a draw. very so quick there's a very linguistics quick overview of linguistics English overview of morphology. English morphology. Now the reason now that the sublexical structure that sublexical is so structure interesting is so interesting in terms of contracted in braille terms of contracted braille um, is that sublexical um, is structure that in braille it, um, structure it, in braille it, it, contracted it, English braille imposes contracted English braille structure on words differently on words does differently print spelling than does print again, spelling. Uh, we're talking again uh, unified english uh, braille here for uh, unified english braille here for different systems, systems because that is what's been in use in the us for in in use in the us 11 years at this uh, point about so take for example the word so need. take for example the word need on the slide in braille slide. this consists of in braille, n this consists of e, n and then the e, symbol dots and then the symbol one, two, four, six. dots one two four six. in print this word in need print, has a diagram need has the a vowel e the vowel is represented e by the sequence of letters represented e by the sequence e of letters e but in braille there is no in braille e there is sequence no e in this e word at all in this word so at if all. you're a kid learning to so if you're a kid to read to, and read, your teacher says look for the your teacher says look e for the vowel team vowel team, vowel team in vowel this word team, a braille reader was well there's a braille reader was there's no e in this word because the second e is subsumed into the d uh, the as D a single symbol with as a single contraction. symbol with the contraction uh, and it's generally assumed uh, and it's generally by most assumed cited teachers of braille by most cited teachers of braille, from their perspectives as from their print readers, readers and the way that they learn braille, readers, and the way that they learn braille uh, that, uh, that you first unpack you first unpack the contractions and the then contractions, decode and then the decode braille into print spelling the and then figure out spelling the and then figure is. out what the word is and this is what and we call the encoded we call view the of encoded braille. where braille, braille is viewed as a code for print viewed as a code for print. rather than as a writing system rather than parallel as a writing to print parallel that represents print. english on its own represents terms. english on its own terms. our ongoing work suggests our ongoing work that conceptualizing braille that conceptualizing as encoded braille print as encoded is not accurate as to what braille readers and writers what braille actually do and writers when we read and write do. when we read and write uh, in the interest of time i'm skipping uh, in the interest of time i'm skipping strengthening uh, the last word on the slide here uh, is the last word on the slide redraw, here is redraw, and that is written R, and that is written R. The symbol dots one two four six. The symbol dots one two four six. And then the letters R A W. And then the letters R A W. So the problem here, so in terms of how this here, contraction in terms of how this contraction English morphology. Wrecks. English is that the final e of the, the re final prefix e of the re and the initial d of the, the draw stem of the draw bridge into, into, into a single symbol into a single and because symbol. of this and because of this uh, there's no way to uh, immediately no way recognize the to immediately re recognize prefix the and draw stem and draw as stem uh, you would as when you're a print uh, reader recognize the morphemes of the language and in fact what often happens for many people when you see the word redraw in braille you, you kind, kind of automatically chunk it as kind of two stems chunk it as the stem red and the stem raw and the stem raw so it kind of leads to re-chunking leads to re-chunking effects so that is a great example so that is of how great braille contractions of how braille contractions wreck the morphological wreck structure the morphological of english structure of in this case english in this case i'll get back to this in a second i'll get back to this in a second now stepping back now from stepping braille back for just a bit from braille to get the bigger bit, picture here the bigger picture here morphology 
morphology matters considerably matters in, in considerably reading. in in reading. It's a central. It's central to reading. It's a central it's recognition central of morphemes. Recognition provides of morphemes the provides structure for fast the structure unconscious for fast reading. Unconscious correspondences reading. between morphology and spelling between morphology enable and spelling, readers to recognize enable readers the stain to stems the stain and affix stems in different and environments in different and to environments generalize their and meanings, generalize across, multiple their word meanings forms. across multiple words. This is sometimes referred to in the literature, this is sometimes as, referred morphological to in the literature as morphological awareness. And there have been decades and there have of been studies decades showing that morphology matters showing for sighted readers of print. For sighted readers of print. Recognition of morphemes facilitates of fast, morphemes fast automatized reading and bolsters comprehension. And bolsters comprehension. But until now, there hasn't been. But until now, work there hasn't been in the reading sciences on morphological reading awareness. Sciences on morphological awareness. Does morphology Braille. also Does morphology matter for Braille? Also matter readers? for Braille readers. Do mismatches between morphological mismatches structure between morphological and contracted structure uh, and Braille orthography uh, impact Braille, orthography Braille reading and writing? Impact. And a spoiler and alert. And a spoiler our ongoing alert work suggests the answer to both work of these questions. The answer to both of these yes. questions is yes. Uh, can I go to? Uh, can so I the go hour? To, I have 10 more minutes? So the is hour? that right? I have 10 more okay. minutes? Is that right? Uh, okay. Well, you know, don't tell me to take my time. Uh, well, I, could know, I could go for another six hours here. I could go for another six hours here. That's dangerous. Um, so here are, um, so we here conducted, are, we conducted, we conducted two studies we conducted so far two to address studies so far this question. To address I'm going to put up a slide at the end. I'm going to put up a slide at the end. Studies with references. It turns out, it seems like most of the students here have read. This is where you can all get up. No, this is where you can all don't get leave. up. No, uh, so I'll just sum up the results since we don't have time to dig into all the details. And there's lots and lots of details and lots of details. So the first study we did so the first was a reaction time study was a reaction time published in 2016 in the journal in 2016 in the journal and that was to test whether and proficient test adult braille readers are affected, readers by, morphological are affected by morphological bridging by morphological in recognizing bridging individual in recognizing individual words so to simplify this so we measured by this among other things among reaction other times things, and reaction error times and when reading a word such as when reading a word such as where the morphemes are where the morphemes are Right, they're not bridged. Right, they're not versus bridged. a word like redraw. Versus a word like redraw, where the morphemes are obscured. The morphemes by a bridging contraction. By a bridging contraction. Turns out, proficient adult turns out, braille readers take longer readers take to recognize longer words that contain a contraction, that, that, bridges contraction a that bridges a morpheme boundary. Bridges a morpheme boundary. And they do this with more errors. And they do this with more errors than when they recognize words. Than when they recognize with the words same morphemes with the same that are not morphemes bridged. that are not. So word like bridged. repay. So right, like has repay, the re prefix, but right, is has not the re bridged. prefix, but is not people bridged. recognized repay people recognized faster repay than they recognized faster redraw. Than they recognized redraw. Our second study Our analyzed second study spelling contest. Analyzed from, spelling contest from. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, chat is I'm sorry, distracting the, me. Chat is distracting me. Um. Um. Our, our second study analyzed our, spelling our study contests analyzed spelling from a large contests, group of children from a large in grades one through four in grades one through who four participate in an annual contest in the United in States and Canada in the United States Braille and Canada Challenge. Some of you may have heard of it. Challenge. Some of this is designed to promote the use of Braille. This is designed to promote the use of Braille. And we looked at uh, and we looked their at, spellings of words uh, with contractions of words that bridge a morpheme boundary. Bridge. A such as the st contraction and the word the st contraction and the word which obscures both the prefix miss and both the stem prefix took miss and the because the s and the t are subsumed the into s a single symbol subsumed into a single versus symbol. their spellings of words where versus these same contractions where these same do not bridge a morpheme do not bridge such as the morpheme st in the word such crystal the st in right, the crystal is not morphologically right, crystal complex. is not morphologically complex and we found that children make we found significantly more braille errors writing words where contracting bridge where morpheme Boundaries, like morpheme boundaries, as compared, words, as compared to writing other words, compared to writing other contraction, where does not bridge a morpheme boundary, does not bridge a morpheme crystal, like crystal. Uh, here is uh, the most complex slide here is of the, the day. Most complex slide of the day. <laughs> I'm going to leave this up for I'm going to about a minute so you can look at it, and then I'm going to describe it, and then you can look at it, and then you can look at it again.
So these are two quick so summary two graphs quick summary of the graphs relevant results from of the both relevant of the studies that I just mentioned. Both of the studies that I just mentioned. The graph on the left summarizes the, the left results summarizes of the, the 2016 study of the 2016 of study of word recognition Braille by word recognition adults. by. It shows two categories of it words. Shows two categories one of words. Where a morpheme boundary one is where bridged a morpheme boundary by a contraction. And that's by exemplified by the Braille by the word Braille redraw. By the word there were many, many other redraw. examples. There were many, many other a, examples. Of course, it's just a, a, an uh, example here. A, an example. And the other here. where the morpheme boundaries the are not where the bridged, morpheme boundaries and that's are not exemplified on the slide by the word on the slide by the word repay. The blue bars show the mean reaction time. The blue bars show the mean reaction time. The bridge category is 2.495 seconds. And the unbridged category is 2.85 seconds. Seconds. So uh, the so uh, the average reaction time average was reaction time four tenths of a second longer four tenths of a second when encountering bridged words when encountering bridged words, words non -bridged as words. compared to non bridged the yellow bars are error rates the yellow bars are error the bridged rates. category is the bridged twenty three point eight percent error and the unbridged error. category is the unbridged point nine percent is error. eight point nine percent so, error. So uh, there is a uh, about a fifteen percent difference about a fifteen error rate difference average error rate across, these, across two. these two people make many more errors, people make in, recognizing many more errors in recognizing words with bridge morphology than words with bridge than morphology words with than unbridged words morphology unbridged morphology the graph on the right summarizes the, on the, the right study of children's spelling test of children's spelling and it tests. shows two categories of and it words shows two categories of those words. where contractions bridge those a where morpheme boundary bridge a morpheme exemplified boundary. by mistook exemplified by mistook and those were the same contraction and those were the same contraction does a not morpheme bridge boundary a exemplified morpheme by boundary. the word crystal. exemplified by the word crystal the average correct the average contraction use correct across contraction all use subjects across all subjects uh, on words containing bridged uh, morphemes on words containing was twenty five percent was twenty five percent while the average correct while the average use correct contraction in non bridge context in non bridge was sixty six percent was sixty six and of course the article goes into a lot more statistical rigor than percentage statistical rigor than we don't need to put people to sleep we don't need to put people to sleep in other words where the rules of braille have the rules of braille morphological structure of words young braille learners. Young were forty one percent were more likely to more not likely use the contraction. Not use so the morphology contraction. matters. So morphology I'll give a matters. few seconds to I'll look at the slide again. Now that to I'm look done at talking. Slide again. Now that I'm done talking. Anyone need more time? Anyone need more time? Good. Okay. Good. Okay. So, what does this tell us? So, what does this tell us? Morphology matters in English. Morphology Braille. matters in English Braille. When the rules of contraction use when the rules come of into conflict use, with into morphological conflict, structure, with morphological both structure, adult Braille readers both and young Braille writers and young tend Braille to follow writers, the morphology. Tend to follow the and this morphology. leads to errors and this in leads Braille to usage. Errors as braille usage defined as prescriptively defined reading and writing braille is not reading simply and a matter braille of is not coding a matter of braille into print spelling when braille reading into print or spelling encoding print spelling, print spelling into braille contraction spelling into braille contraction if it were if it were then contractions that cross morpheme boundaries that cross would morpheme not show differences would in usage accuracy differences in usage from those very same contractions from those very same don't contractions bridge morphemes. that don't bridge morphemes Uh, this is the uh, last this is sort the of meaty last slide, sort of meaty um, slide um, talking about the links between our work the links and uh, between society. Our work so and, uh, there's society. several so implications. There's several and, implications um, and um, um, for our work. Uh, so for our work. Uh, so uh, for Braille literacy. What is braille what literacy. is our ongoing work? What is our ongoing work to do with braille have, uh, to do with? Well, it provides evidence-based well, support. Well, it provides evidence-based teaching support. braille as a writing system. Teaching braille as a writing on its own terms, on its rather own terms, than as code for rather than as code for. So, if teachers who are usually so visual readers who are usually braille, visual readers of braille, primarily would come to understand braille come and to experience understand braille, braille and experience uh, as a writing braille, system rather than as a writing code that represents print, code that represents print, then we may find. Uh, we that may they find are, um, uh, that they are. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to. 
Yeah, I'm going to rewind. I'm going to restate Rewind. I'm going to restate that. Cancel. <laughs> uh, if teachers who are usually visual uh, readers who are Braille usually primarily understand and experience Braille, Braille as a code experience that represents a print, code that represents then they print. may currently then consciously they may or not be teaching students to be more like teaching print students to be more like rather than Braille readers rather than Braille readers but rather uh, if teachers rather, intentionally uh, if teachers Conceptualize Braille as a writing system Braille as a that represents system language that represents parallel language to, equal to, parallel and not to, dependent on print, and not dependent on print. Then they may better be able to. Then they may better uh, be enable able to, students uh, enable to achieve students reading fluency to achieve and literacy. fluency and literacy. Secondly, evidence-based support. Secondly, evidence-based support for ongoing revisions to the for usage ongoing rules revisions of English for Braille, the usage rules taking into English account Braille, English sublexical taking into structure. account English sublexical structure. Morphology matters for Braille readers Morphology and, matters and for should, Braille be readers and should be taken in into account in the teaching, teaching of Braille and in, and in of further Braille future refinements and further future to refinements the Braille system itself. To the Braille system itself. For the reading sciences, for the reading science, because the bridging phenomena because is the bridging so specific phenomena to this so writing system, specific to this writing system, Braille provides some of the strongest evidence. Some of the strongest yet, evidence that morphology matters. Yet, that morphology English matters. English contracted English Braille offers unique evidence Braille that inherent knowledge of sublexical that structure, structure knowledge of sublexical tends structure. to take precedence tends to over precedence prescriptive over rules of prescriptive uh, of rules spelling. of uh, of spelling. Um. I also would say um, for the reading science, a broader, the more inclusive a perspective, more inclusive on reading and writing, on reading and that, writing, that Braille something that can give that us. Braille can give us. Researching Braille contributes to the literacy, Braille contributes to the literacy and empowerment of people who are blind and visually impaired. Right. The science of reading right. has the proven, science of beneficial, reading has proven people, beneficial for many people. Beneficial for many people, but its applied benefits but have been mostly limited. Have been mostly limited. Have been mostly to typically limited, cited to typically cited. And I would say typically hearing. And I would say individuals hearing, who read print. individuals who read print. Our work seeks a broader, more inclusive, broader, perspective, more inclusive on perspective on literacy by focusing, literacy, by focusing on Braille reading. By focusing on Braille reading and writing. So I would sort of like to so end with I would this sort of like question that we might want to all think about. Like, that we might what would a broader, what would a broader, like, inclusive, and engaged science of reading, engaged science look like? of reading, and look uh, like? how uh, might we how achieve might it? We achieve it. Uh, the next slide is uh, our the uh, next slide is our funding statement uh, and acknowledgement statement and acknowledgements. I'll just read this fast in case there are uh, blind, blind readers who can't read the slide. Blind readers who can't. The research reported here was the supported by the Institute for Education, Institute for Education Sciences, Sciences, U.S. Department, U.S. Department of Education Sciences, Sciences, Sciences through Department grant number education, through uh, grant number R three two three two four a one nine blah blah. I'm not going to read this. A one nine blah blah. I'm not going to read this. To Rice University, the opinions expressed are those of the authors and do not those of the authors and do not represent of the institute or the U.S. Department of Education or the U.S. Department. I'd like to thank Alaria. I'd like to thank Barthelotti for inviting me. And I especially like to express my appreciation to Jen and L'Oreal for interpreting and for following me around all day and hopefully not getting too bored. Hopefully not. So thank you all. So thank you all. Oh, one more slide. So this. Oh, one more slide. So this is uh, the references is, uh, that I talked about. The references um, that I talked about. You're welcome about, to take a um, picture of the slide if you want the references. Or if you want, email me. I'm happy to send them. Email me. I'm happy to send them to you. Either way. Either way. So I'll turn it over. Uh, so I'll turn it over uh, to whoever is moderating. To whoever the is moderating questions. the questions. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. So. Oh, okay. So let me. Oh, oh someone wants to take a picture. Oh, someone wants to take a picture. They don't want you in the picture. No, to... could you imagine? They no, don't. could you imagine? So, don't. so first, thank you so first, much thank you for your talk. So much for your talk. Beautiful presentation. Beautiful. So presentation. fascinating. So and fascinating. So perfectly and aligned so with, perfectly our aligned with our pen regarding program regarding making sure that our work has direct sure applications to real life and society. So thank society. you so very much. So thank you so very much. Secondly. Secondly, I'd also like to express my I'd also like to um, express my um, uh, apologies for not introducing uh, myself. Apologies for up earlier. Myself I'm, Dr. Up earlier. I'm Dr. Alaria Bertoletti. Dr. Alaria Bertoletti. And sorry, I didn't say that earlier, but now you know. Sorry, I didn't say that earlier, but now uh, you know. I'd also uh, like also 
to like say sorry for closing the chat. Say sorry for closing. I the didn't chat. realize that what I had done. I didn't realize um, that what I had done. Um, I didn't realize that the way I had set up the I chat was interfering with the chat was interfering with the presentation. With the presentation so I'm sorry, very uh, presentation. So I'm sorry, sorry Dr. Dr. Engelbretson, for that. Sorry, Dr. Engelbretson. However, the Q and A is still open. The Q and A. So if you have any questions, please type those into the Q and A into the Q and A online audience. For the online audience, and then the last thing before we officially the open up before we officially floor for questions, the, floor for the questions. large pages the large of Braille pages we need to Braille, have returned. We need to have so returned. we're going to come around and collect so we're that during the Q and A. The smaller, the, cards, though, the smaller cards, though, you're welcome. Smaller cards, though, you're welcome. Take many of the smaller cards. I don't want to take the smaller cards. I don't want to take them back. Feel free to. So. Feel free to and I also wanted to let you know, Dr. Engelbretson, you know we have Dr. 30 participants. We have 30 oh, participants. And in the room, and I'd say a little room, over 30. I'd say a little over 30. So total about so, 60. Total people. about 60. And got to enjoy people. your presentation today. Got to enjoy okay, so um, anyone in the okay, room so have um, anyone in the room have questions? volunteers go first? Oh, God. Yeah, several hands up over oh, here. God. Several hands up over here. This is Haley, and I'm going to touch you. Oh, hi. Haley, oh, great. Oh, hi. Because I'm deafblind. Oh, great. Uh, Good to meet you. I just wanted to let you know I was here, and that's how my name feels in toe tactile. Mm -hmm. I'm deaf and blind, and so this is my PT name like right. this. And so also I wanted to tell you that I had learned Braille through a uh, my vision first, using mm -hmm. vision, and later through tactile. And I realized it's so much better that if I was to learn Braille tactilely first would have been so much better. And so I was wondering, um, can I show you something really quick? Right. Um, so if I have my hand like yours, but if we are teaching deafblind people how to use Braille, mm -hmm. we'll do it on the palm of their hand like this, if you turn your hand over, and then we tend to identify the dots oh. in this way, right? That would be familiar to you. But in pro-tactile language, if we're using it, we've developed our ABCs in a different way, okay. ABCs and numbers. So this might be familiar to you if I was to spell out. You see how I've there connected the dots together mm -hmm. in a movement with my fingers? Mm -hmm. And okay. so we have just developed that. That's a new part of our emerging language just last year. Great, thank you for showing me that. I've I uh, have heard of protactile, but this is my first direct experience with it. So thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, that's great. <laughs> oh. Okay, so I also wanted to let you know that just uh, as I've shown, I've shown you the ABCs. Um, when we do the first part of the alphabet, A through J, we just use one pointer oh. finger to indicate that. But when we start from the letter K all the way through Z, we'll use a full four fingers to connect those things together. So if I was to use your hand like this, starting with A, B, C, all the way to the letter J, once I get to K, you see how that feels different because I'm using my four flat fingers together to express each of those connections. If we're just to use the one finger for the whole alphabet, then B and L are hard to distinguish because they're just two both downward movements. Great, well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Yeah, and so I'm just so fascinated in your presentation, your research. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you so much for that response, Dr. Engelbretson. Um, so from the Q&A, we have someone online who wanted to know from the two books that you mentioned at the start of your talk, um, they asked if you could repeat them. I think they were um, books that are well known in the reading sciences. So there's a request to repeat the titles yeah, of those, those two books. Three. Um, <laughs> I don't have them in my notes. So I'm going to have to remember off the top of my head. These are always dangerous. So the Handbook of the Reading Sciences, second edition, edited by Snowling, Holm, and Nation. So S N O W L I N G. Holm, I think, is H U L M E. And Nations, like nations. Uh, the general interest books that I talked about was Mark Seidenberg, S E I D E N B E R G, Language at the Speed of Sight. Uh, there's a long subtitle that I'm not going to remember. <laughs> and then the other uh, was Marianne Wolf, who has written a number of really excellent books, but the one I was thinking of in particular was Proust and the Squid, The Story and Science of the Reading Brain. And I may not get, have gotten those exactly, so you may have to uh, use uh, our friendly Google. Or something.
Any other questions from the audience? We have one. Hi, my name is Deanna Gagne. I'm a professor in the linguistics department here. Oh, I linguist. also, yay, <laughs> and a psychologist. Oh, yeah. Well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so I am thinking about the mechanism for the morphological interference with the contractions. I am assuming that most of the kids are also speakers of English, yeah. correct? Okay. So when they speak English and they, they've they already learned the morphological components in, or the morphemes in speech, and so that's why there's an interference with the Braille contractions. Right. Right? But yeah. um, I, I kind of like to add on to that, that it's not just that there's an interference, but that the morphemes in written English, of course, also are, are super important for recognizing the forms. So it's not, not only is there interference from having learned spoken English first, because you've already acquired the English morphology, but it does make a difference in your ability to then, uh, you know, pair a form and meaning usually when you use it. So there's two things, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so then I'm wondering, what would you hypothesize would happen for a deaf-blind kid who is learning Braille without prior experience with spoken language? Uh, I am not someone who likes to hypothesize <laughs> without <laughs> having data, but if this were to be a research a hypothesis for a research question, I would hypothesize that, well, uh, uh, do they have, uh, what is their language background? Do they have uh, Protactile? Do they have tactile ASL? Uh, what are they learning from as mm -hmm. their background? But secondly, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to make the hypothesis because um, there are other English words that have similar stems and similar morphemes, and people may have generalized that through the reading process as well. But if I if I had if you like made me make a hypothesis, I would probably think that uh, they would not show the same interference effect. But again, I don't like to hypothesize without some data to back it up. That gets us in trouble. Got it. Well, maybe one day the two of us can work together. Yeah, maybe. All right, thanks. Another question, someone's coming down to the front. Hi there, my name is Lorna Quant. Where should I stand? Over here? Counterintuitive to go off to the side. Okay, so um, again, I'm Lorna Quant and I am a psychologist. Hopefully that's okay. <laughs> So I am wondering about how much information Braille readers get from their hands if their perceptual or tactile sense sensitivity is higher than a sighted person. So when you showed us the Braille readers, the two videos, the two-handed and the one-handed, you mentioned that it's possible that they're getting information from the left hand that's tracking while the right hand is reading. So they're getting information simultaneously and you likened it to parafoveal vision and that increased reading span. So what do we know about that? Do we know if they're getting information from that tracking hand? Is it from their thumbs? Um, do all of the fingers get meaningful information? What do we know? Well, and I would love for you to give me an evidence on that, no hypothesis. Okay, well, Braille readers don't read with our thumbs. Uh, so definitely, uh, maybe the thumbs are touching, but generally most people would tuck their thumbs under. Um, we don't know. There hasn't been uh, research in that area. I mean, much of the work on Braille is still very 
preliminary. Uh, so uh, I can't give you any evidence on that because so far there hasn't been much. There was a psychologist, a cool psychologist, <laughs> named Susanna Miller. Do they exist, cool ones? Oh, well, uh, of course, you're here, right? <laughs> um, a couple uh, of us. A, uh, a psychologist named Susanna Miller, M-I-L-L-A-R, who had done a lot of research uh, on Braille uh, in the United Kingdom, published a book in 1997 called Reading by Touch, which pretty much summarized her life's work. Uh, and unfortunately, there hasn't been many people taking up her questions and her research since then in the last uh, 25 years. So my colleagues have suggested that it's time to write a book. So I, I, may, <laughs> I may do that, but we don't know uh, exactly what kind of information people are getting from uh, as, as their other hand is tracking. Uh, some people have suggested it helps sort of uh, give a sense of where the next, what the next line might be, what kind of information might be on it, how long the line is, how, what the size of the words are. But we don't have any studies yet that really dig into that as we should. Very interesting. Thank you so much for that response. And I understand more clearly than ever that we need a lot more research in this area. Definitely. So just putting it out there, I think that maybe I've seen a little research in the past about this topic, but mm -hmm. if Braille readers, uh, the question of whether or not Braille readers have a larger area in their brain that is related to finger representation, mm -hmm. So if their finger area of the brain is larger um, or takes up more space yeah, in true. the brain because of the processing, yeah. I would imagine that the answer would be yes, but I don't actually know I think, uh, if there's, there's a, conclusive there's, findings. There's a neuroscientist, his last name is Pasquale Leone, who has done work showing that, showing the uh, sensory motor regions are, are larger. And he was doing um, transcranial magnetic stimulation and other things to show that his work is fairly early on. Of course, there is Nina Betney's wonderful work on uh, neuroplasticity and blindness. I know she, uh, I was looking over who previous speakers were to, uh, on the list, and I know that she gave a talk here a few years ago, but she does wonderful work on uh, neuroplasticity and the role of, um, of experience in shaping the brain, uh, especially with blind, uh, with uh, blind people. Thank you so much. So as a follow-up to Dr. Quant's comment and question, our students, while they were reading your publications, um, were talking about how we could test the the reading span. And we know that sighted people have a certain digit span in reading, and there are a number of regressions that people make for saccades, eye movements, when we're um, tracking a page or reading them or reading. And I was wondering if Braille readers use, who use more than one finger or hand, if they capture some of that information like anticipatorily, if they get a sense of some words that are going to occur later on the page, and if we could use your new technology switch and swap the cell with a different cell mm -hmm. later in a word, could we then see if people catch that yeah. earlier and are they more accurate in their reading? So that was part of our right. conversation in class. So there, can I um, jump in on this? So, so a few things. So first of all, when I said paraphobia, I didn't mean increasing the reading span. I meant that you're picking up areas outside of your central focus of reading, what your fingers are currently going under. So it's not like you're expanding the window, but you're maybe getting information from somewhere else. So I, I, I maybe it's not the best metaphor that I use. Secondly, there has been work done on regressions in Braille reading. Susanna Miller did a lot of work on that. There's a 
psychologist in New Zealand named Barry Hughes, who's published a lot on that. Unfortunately, he only uses one finger and has people using an acceler accelerometer on one finger. Um, but what we also see, one of the things that we see print readers do with regression is when you have a two-handed braille reader, the hand, the right hand, say, can stay at the spot where the regression starts, and the left hand can pop up and look back earlier on the page for for whatever information is being regressed to. And if, for example, if you're only allowing a participant to read with one finger, you miss out on that possibility for getting information uh, from earlier in the text. So it wouldn't technically be a regression. You're not moving your hand back to that point, but you're taking your whatever hand is not reading at that point and reaching up to find that and, and read it that way. So there's really, uh, Susanna Miller had one subject in her uh, study that did that, uh, but there's been very little work on two-handed readers and using the second hand to essentially get information in the same way that a sighted print reader would, uh, you know, same kind of information that you would get through regression. Now, the third question, third part of your question had to do with using a braille display technology to change later points in a word, uh, later cells in a word. And uh, there is a, uh, there was a PhD student in Ireland at the University of Nunut named Interplan Aranyanat. She was from, uh, she's of Thai origin. And her PhD dissertation did exactly that in uh, some instances. And it's been a while since I read it, so I'm not gonna be able to tell you exactly what her findings were, but um, they were using a technology to change the, you know, essentially change the letters that a person hadn't read with their primary reading finger yet to see what, what happened. Um, so if you want a reference to her dissertation, I, uh, it's not one of them that I can recite off the top of my head. So email me and I'll, uh, I'll try and get it to you. All right, well, I always have more questions, but I'm going to wait and see if anyone in the room has one. Okay, so my next question is a little provocative. All right. So your pre your, sort of the goal of the presentation was perhaps to prompt us thinking about viewing Braille reading as separate from print reading in its own right. It's its own thing. So, and you suggested that we perhaps think about not using contractions oh. across morphine boundaries. Yes, right, important. And I'm thinking, again, I said it was gonna be provocative. Why not consider a more phonological approach to Braille? So to scrap any considerations with print at all, why not, why not go that route? Who is asking? Especially for English. <laughs> Sorry, this is from Aloria. Sorry, oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, okay, so you're the person I need to uh, to yell at later. No. Uh, so, okay, so I guess there are a couple responses to that because that would basically be developing a completely new writing system for uh, blind and visually impaired people that would be separate from English. And my point in saying we, we need to understand Braille as a writing system in its own right doesn't mean that it's not or shouldn't be linked to spoken English or to the system we have for spoken English. So first of all, any kind of phonologically based writing system for English is going to fall apart very quickly uh, from a sociolinguistic perspective because whose variety of English are we going to represent phonologically? That's one of the reasons why um, efforts to achieve some sort of phonologically based writing for English is just doesn't work because there are so many varieties of English. Whose variety are you going to privilege? Is it gonna be white Midwesterners? You know, who is it gonna be people who speak the Queen's English from Britain? The problem, that's the main problem why I wouldn't recommend a phonological approach to English in any writing system. But the second part of that is um, 
you know, those of us who are blind and visually impaired do type print. We use QWERTY keyboards. We type in print all the time. Uh, we need to know about print. So uh, I would hate to to make Braille a different order of writing system than English print is would make that whole process a lot harder. So I uh, hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you so much for that response. And it wasn't too and provocative. I was worried. <laughs> <laughs> I was scared to ask it. <laughs> uh, okay. I also have another bit of curiosity. I think that you said. Who's asking? Is this Alaric? Still Alaric. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. I keep forgetting to state uh, my name. So I think you talked about how numbers are written in Braille and that there's a symbol that precedes the cell. And so it's the same cell um, that exists for number, excuse me, letters, but if it's preceded by a six or what it was, then it's a number. Am I right in understanding that? In some instances, yes. Uh, I think I see where this question is going and <laughs> this is not, uh, I, I don't wanna interrupt you, but I think this question is something I can answer right here without spending a long time explaining some of the different systems for real numbers and, and that kind of thing. And it's, um, there's a sort of a big controversy brewing in the American Braille world about how to best represent mathematics in Braille because there are currently kind of two systems that half the country <laughs> wants one and half wants the other. And uh, this is really like, I don't wanna, uh, I think answering this question is gonna be very tricky. So we can talk about that later if you want. Okay. Well, I, I'm i gonna still ex share what I was thinking because um, I'm curious to know if my, so if my assumption's correct, I'm wondering about how a cell for a letter might interfere with someone's comp, like processing numeric information. That was my basic I question, but given what, yeah, <laughs> so. Yeah, so I guess then there, there there's much more to things. that are being made in the Braille world right now about this question, and I just can't weigh in on this without a big lot more discussion here. Understood, understood. Okay, well, um, I see another person in the room has a question, Dr. Pleissey. Hi there. Hi. My name is Rachel Peasy. We met earlier today, yes. I'm thinking a little about like when we use language, we often use, oh, I'm not in the right spot. Over here, good? Okay. Um, so we use language to connect some concepts and to connect that with certain percepts, right? So, you know, we'll connect to a certain system within the body and in the brain. One of the things I was recently thinking about is the idea that only connecting one percept to a specific concept might actually be limiting our ability to learn in how we understand the processes of learning. To give an example, if we only think about reading as a visual modality, or if we only think about learning to read as specifically connecting learning phonemes, what about kids who are learning to read who don't have access to sound? So now I'm thinking about a lot of these sorts of cognitive processes that 
maybe we have assumptions that there's one way to learn with only one percept. But perhaps really what we have are amodal systems that underlie these processes. So how do you think we might be able to leverage some of this cognitive amodality process or amodal processing and use that for the benefit of applying to different strategies across different learners? I have no idea. <laughs> That's um, a big question. I, I, <clears throat> I'm, I'm just a linguist. I don't, you know. <laughs> That's my fallback. No, I, I, um, I really have no idea, although that's a great question, uh, but I, I think it's kind of outside of my area of expertise. Alaria again. All right, well, I think our time is up. It has gone by quickly. This was such an amazing presentation. Um, such a fascinating topic. I'm certain that everyone that's attended has learned so much, and I'm sure that all of us have had our eyes opened about how much more there is to learn on this topic. So we will keep an eye out for forthcoming work of yours. With that, I will close the webinar. Thank you. But for those in the room, we have refreshments off to the side of the room. We've got coffee, oops, uh, coffee, uh, some snacks. Thank you again, Dr. Engelbretson. And then students, if you have any questions that you just were too shy to ask up front, feel free to ask during the reception. And one final thank you and goodbye to our remote audience. Thank you all. This has been very enjoyable. <laughs>